You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So today we've got a little bit of news, and uh, I've got a couple opinions, and then, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Doing a podcast bed podcast routine, gotta be honest, it's, it's tough. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to be easy. I don't know. We'll find out. But um, yeah, I woke up super tired. Come down here with my new little coffee deal here. Coffee muggy thing. And uh, sit down and go, all right, let's go. It's like, oh, wait, I already talked about everything yesterday. <laughs> I, I got to do a different thing, though. I can't, I can't talk about the stuff that I said I wanted to talk about because that was already done yesterday. Fortunately, Packers to the rescue. They hired a couple people. So boom, boom, bang. Here we go. If you'd like to support the podcast, packernet.com, no, you see what I'm saying? Do you, I mean, are you, do you, are you ready for this? Are you even, I'm not ready, are you ready? I hope somebody's ready, because, oh man, by the way, I've said it 900 times, just about every other day I say it, but I'm telling you right now, I've never been this tired in my life. That vacation was not a vacation. There was physical labor involved. I had to lift bags and swim and stuff. Jeez, I had to like move? Man, oh man, I am beat. Let me try this one more time. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you'd like to support the podcast. There's also some other links. Packernet.com for all your news, notes, and information. NFLBigBoard.com for, uh, you know, lists of prospects. Got their highlights, film, breakdowns, and scouting reports. Pretty good resource. What else shall we talk about? Um, the Facebook group. Be sure to jump in the Facebook group. It's in the description. If you'd like to just click that, and make it real easy for you. Otherwise, go to Facebook and search Packernet Podcast. I'm willing to bet it's there. At least I hope it is. If not, I have been giving bad advice for a long time. Best of luck finding it. Uh, oh, the phone number. Yes, yes, yes. For questions that you may have, Call or text 608-501-0718. If you'd like to call in for what grinds my gears, please call 608-501-0718. See, the one number has zeros and one has O's. Get it? <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to play with these jokes today. I, it's, it's just a joke. It's a dumb joke. Same phone number. <sighs> Can't even laugh at my own dad jokes today. So I guess since it is not officially, well, let, let's kind of talk about uh, the playoffs a little bit, I guess, because it's one opinion, but then that's also something else to talk about. First of all, because I'm sure I'm the only person here that knows this, uh, the Patriots won and the Rams won, which, if I'm not mistaken, is exactly what I said. So 2-0, and burn. First time I got 100% all year, but it still counts. Technically, mathematically, that's still 100%. Now, yes, it does appear... That the referees kind of, you know, there's some issues there. Some questions about the victories. In particular, what happened to the Saints with a very blatant missed call. But let me just start right there because, yeah, the officiating is pretty terrible. We all know it. But I don't really know exactly what we can do about it. But I think there's a bit of a difference between a no call and a bad call. Because, you know, as much as it seems more severe at the end of the game... The fact of the matter is you can't start being more accurate at the end of the game. Calls are just calls. And we've heard I've heard some people kind of fly off the rails to the extent that they're saying that the referees basically are are uh I don't know, picking and choosing winners whatever, but just to be clear, let's say for example what Clay Matthews did. The penalty in the Vikings game. Now, it's, uh, that that's even a bad example, because technically I think that did break the rule. It was just a, a ridiculous rule at the time. I don't know. I don't have an example. But the point is, when you see something and you throw a flag and you say, you broke a rule, therefore we're going to nullify whatever happened, and actually you didn't break a rule, that's a pretty serious problem. Granted, everybody makes mistakes. It's just a mistake. Um, 
I look forward to the day when we can use all this awesome technology we have to monitor the field and they can do things more correctly, more accurately, right? Get, get pressure sensing pads on the, on the players and, you know, did he touch them before the ball got there? Yeah, flag. there'd probably be more flags doing that. Maybe we could tweak the algorithm to let people get away with some stuff once in a while. I don't really know. But at least it'll be consistent and everyone can stop crying. But not calling something essentially, in my opinion, means you didn't see it. And to phrase it in a way in which the referees are deliberately doing something to impact the outcome of the game, when in fact what they did was not do something, that's not necessarily the case. The referees cannot see everything at all times. And we, especially as fans, have the ability to see replay over and over and over in slow motion. And we see this, and the more we see it, the more we get outraged. How could he not see that? But in... When I saw it live, which, by the way, I didn't see it live, but when I saw the live footage of it, like, after 16 replays, it was like, eh. The thing that makes it difficult is it was sort of a back shoulder throw, so the guy's already spinning backwards, and as he gets hit, he continues to spin. So if the referee is on the back side of it, all you can see is the defender on the opposite side of the guy catching the ball, the guy catching the ball who's spinning, and then the ball is kind of coming in the way, and maybe it's obstructed, I don't know. I'm just saying that this outrage that the referees are blatantly doing something terrible doesn't make any sense. Now, I'll give you an example. I do have an example. A very blatant call that should never have been called was the call against Tom Brady. Now, the reason this is much more egregious is you should not throw a flag unless you specifically saw somebody break a rule. He obviously didn't see any rule being broken because a rule was not broken. An arm came across Tom Brady and hit him in the shoulder. And the referee threw a flag. So you didn't see it, but you threw a flag because you think it probably happened. That, to me, is problematic. I would rather default to, let's just not throw flags. Because I don't want phantom flags. I don't want the referee on the other side of the play going, eh, based on when he started spinning a little bit harder, and based on where the ball was two seconds ago when I saw it, if I were to do a rough mathematical calculation in my mind, I would guess he probably got there first. If you didn't see it, don't call it. By the way, something else I would be okay with? It takes a little bit of time from get to play to play. If there's something that blatant, why doesn't New York just have the ability to throw a flag? Maybe we should have referees actually just as guys that watch cameras, and you can have 65 referees watching 85 different cameras, and whenever they see something, you can have six different people watching around that camera going, oh, I think I saw something. You replay it four times before the next play, and then the flag comes out doesn't even have to slow things down. we got so many people, it's moving so fast, it takes a while for the next play to get up anyways. So the only people, the, the, there's only basically one guy on the field, and that's the flag thrower guy. And they radio into him, and they're like, oop, there was a penalty, throw a flag, and then they throw a flag. And we speed it up, we don't have to have this ridiculous conference in the middle of the field. He just starts walking out to the middle of the field, and by the time he gets there, they already radioed in number, what happened, blah, blah, blah. And then he, you know, says his deal, and then he walks to the sideline, and the guy starts, you know, the coach starts screaming at him, but he's just like, dude, I'm just doing my job. I didn't even, I wasn't even paying attention. I'm playing Candy Crush on my phone. I don't know what happened. You think I made that call? I'm just the guy that says stuff. I shouldn't even be wearing this striped shirt. But anyways, until we get to that point, you got to understand there are going to be calls that are missed. But again, the one thing I do have a problem with is calling things that aren't there. Sometimes it's a judgment. Okay, fine. Sometimes it's kind of 50-50. But in general, if you didn't see it, don't throw the flag. Don't say you saw Tom Brady get punched in the face as he was throwing the football if you didn't actually see it, because obviously you didn't see it. You saw an arm come across Tom Brady, and you thought, whoa, that looked like based on his angle and trajectory that it probably hit him in the head. I better throw a flag. No, man, don't, because you didn't see it. So obviously all these things are terrible. You shouldn't lose a game based on officiating. But I just want to point out that difference. And it would be nice, you know, I I remember when they started talking about, like, baseball. First of all, we don't want instant replay. And then I went on to say, why why, why why does baseball even have any officiating whatsoever? Because that would be very easy to just let technology take over. We've already got the little box thing we can see everything. And by the way, I'm very impressed with how good that umpire is at calling balls and strikes. I used to think that guy was just getting 50% wrong, but now that you see that box, it's like, dude, I'm wrong every time, and how do you get that right every time? It's unbelievable. But a lot of baseball fans are are not into that. They're, you know, it's all about tradition and whatnot. I talked to my one friend who actually likes that sport for some weird reason, 
And he started talking to me about the human element of the game. Dude, yeah, the human element of the players and the coaches and people that are actually on the teams, not the human element of the referees. I mean, are you okay with, like, fans running onto the field and, like, knocking somebody out? Like, well, it's the human element. I mean, you got to account for that stuff. No, that's not part of it. Like, ooh, you got blasted with a laser pointer in the eye. Well, human element, nothing we can do. Bottom line is the referees serve no purpose. They're a necessary evil. And the sooner we can move this to an all-robotic system, the better it'll be. Again, football is going to be very difficult because basically there's a penalty on every single play. The refs just kind of let them get away. And that's kind of part of the problem. You could probably throw a flag on every single play, yet they don't. So when we start screaming, oh, there's a penalty, it's like, yeah, I know, dude, and so do the refs. But, I mean, what are you supposed to do? We also complain there's too many flags. So I... To be fair, they can't win. If you call it but you didn't see it, you did the wrong thing. But if you don't call it, and you th- if you think it happened, but you don't call it because you didn't see it definitively, and it did happen, well, now you still did a bad thing. So, you know, there is no solution that's going to fix this. Unless and until we go back to the system that I just said, with all the cameras and all the people. They don't have to wear uniforms, they can wear pajamas for all I care. But the fact that everybody in the stadium and everybody in the stands and everybody watching at home can see a penalty and the referees can't, that seems like a backward system. They should have all the technology we have. We've already had the last couple years New York being able to radio in and and review stuff. Let's just move that to being the full thing. Is this like a union issue where like the referees have certain rights and we don't want them to lose their job? I mean, you can still get paid and have a job, man. You're just not going to be getting camera time. You take your job over into the booth somewhere and you and your zebra friends sit around and watch stuff and anytime you think you see a penalty just real quick rewind it and make double sure and then call it into the flag thrower which by the way think about that you're gonna have be promoting some water boy to flag thrower and that's a sweet job and then the biggest controversy we're gonna see with referees is the fact that they're all like 16 year old kids who can't get it out like spit it out junior come on now he's saying it word for word to you in your ear how can you not say this But otherwise, the game will be perfect, and it'll be wonderful. But yes, once again, we end the season exactly as we started it, hoping the Patriots don't win the Super Bowl. I mean, it's just... (sighs) Good for them, you know? It's it's awesome. If it was the Packers, obviously, you you never want your team... You're never going to say, okay, enough is enough, we need to stop winning. But at what point does the NFL just completely ban the Patriots from playing? Because this is just... It's not even fun, man. Every time we get to this point in the year, it's like... What was the point of this season? There's never going to be a better team. There's never going to be a better coach. There's never going to be a better quarterback. And I know, whoa, 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 Rodgers is the GOAT. Yeah, I understand that. But you fast forward 20 years. Aaron Rodgers is going to be mixed in with a lot of other people, with Brett Favre and Dan Marino and all these other guys. Tom Brady is going to stand alone. Everybody for all time since forever will recognize Tom Brady as the greatest ever. Today, we can dispute that because we get to watch how people play. And we can go, look, Tom Brady throws these five-yard passes. He's got Bill Belichick. He's got better defenses. His passes aren't even all that impressive. He can't move. He's completely immobile, which is fine because he has seven seconds to throw the football every single play. His wide receivers are all wide open. We can do that today. But I'm just telling you, when we're old, we are going to be the angriest fans in the history of the world because everybody will have moved on and acknowledged Tom Brady is the greatest. You're going to start to see Packers fans who forget, because you kind of forget over time, exactly the stark, how stark the contrast is between the two. You're going to start hearing Packer fans go, well, it is hard to dispute. Now, we're just going to lose our minds. And we're going to be a bunch of old, wrinkled up curmudgeons who are like twitching, just saying Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> It's just the reality of it. And what's really horrible is I just, I, I'm, be, at this point, you can't, what up, dance party, how you doing? Sorry to tell you I'm not in the mood. Thank you very much. At this point, if you actually think there's going to come a time when the Patriots are just going to be too old and can't do it, it's really just going to be we have to play this dance every year until Tom Brady decides to retire. And then at that point, just really hope that it's not Bill Belichick doing this whole thing in that time. I mean, the, the only good thing is that we could say, ha-ha, Tom Brady, you're a bomb. But then how many more years do we have to watch the Patriots go to the Super Bowl? I mean, all year long, what are we talking about? We're talking about there's all these storylines and all this narrative and all this stuff. Look at how great nobody wants to touch the Colts and the Chiefs are as good as they get and the Saints have never been better and all this stuff. And it just gets whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. And what is it again? The Patriots again. 
the Patriots and somebody. The NFC is the only place to be because it's the only place where you you at least have a shot to get to the Super Bowl and, and possibly win because the Patriots, they're probably going to get to the Super Bowl. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to win. But, I mean, you got to understand that they've been doing this so long. It's basically, for a large portion of our society, it's their entire lifetime. For people like me, it's almost, what, half my lifetime? Actually, probably more than that. Substantially. I mean, it, it, oh my goodness. What, since 2000? They've been a dynasty? We're talking 20 years? I mean, it's just... Can I mean, if we all just take a vote and say you are the greatest team in history and nobody will ever be better, can they just please stop? Can we agree to just abolish that team and start a new franchise? Maybe split it in half and just have 33 teams? I don't know how you're going to do that. Let's split it into three and make it an even 34. You got the Patriots and you got two other offshoots. And Bill Belichick and Tom Brady have to go to another team in another city, away from Robert Kraft. Actually, you know what? We got to split it up. There's the Patriots which is Robert Kraft and whoever else. You got the Bill Belichicks. We'll just call them the Bill Belichicks. The Montana Belichicks. And the the Mobile, Alabama Bradys. I don't know. We'll try to disperse them across the country. Hopefully one of them doesn't go to the Super Bowl, but somehow there's going to be three teams in the Super Bowl, and it'll be those three teams. Seriously, though, I'm I'm really, really tired of it. Every single year at this time, I'm, I'm texting my friends going, what was the point of this whole season? All the hype, all the excitement, and again, it's just it's all just false build-up to watch the Patriots try to win another Super Bowl. It's all just pretense for the Patriots. I, I'm, I'm over it, man. That's all football is. I mean, it's to the point where it's like, you better enjoy what's going on during the regular season because the idea that all this is about the Super Bowl and everybody's just striving for that one thing, get that out of your head. Especially AFC teams, just get that right out of your head right now. It, it makes it frustrating because I feel like all this build-up and all this excitement and all this work that we've put in over the year has been for nothing because really it's all just about the Patriots at the end of the day. And it's part of the reason why it's so upsetting seeing the officials tend to lean a little bit more in the Patriots' favor. They don't need any help. Thank you very much. I don't know. Whatever. All I know is I'm going to be the biggest Rams fan in a couple weeks that has ever existed. But even so, man, just getting to the, to the Super Bowl just adds to their to their legend and I'm just tired of it man I I just I want them to miss the playoffs so badly I mean even I I, I'm I'm not gonna go there but (laughs) I was gonna go somewhere dark and I just won't but seriously just please miss the playoffs and no I wasn't talking about injuring anybody don't don't get all crazy on me don't start putting thoughts in my head all right you don't know what I was thinking all right, moving on. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to briefly touch on, I, when I first saw it, I just thought, this is so what? How, how can you even write an article about this? This is absolutely nothing. And that is, Equinemia St. Brown tweeted out, won't be home this time next year. Tweeted that out a couple days ago. Now, again, my first thought is, you know, whatever. This is just stuff people say. Who really cares? But I think it's good because what we've been talking about is wanting to have a new energy and a new outlook. There's a concern that I have about the locker room, about guys just going through the motions. Where's the passion? Where's the desire? Equinemius St. Brown is starting. He's trying to ignite a little something. Got a whole bunch of young coaches, a whole bunch of young players. Hopefully a lot of that cancerous material is out of the locker room. A lot of the the, uh, apathetic coaches are out of the building. We got to start building up a fire and you got to start that with a little bit of kindling you know get a little bit of that that orange glow going so i like this and i want to build on this i want to see more of this the earlier the better because this is the kind of attitude that makes a difference and coming from a guy like equinemius is a good thing too because he's a guy that i mean i don't want to call him a bubble guy but if we can get him to really step up and embrace that role and be a number two wide receiver that could be huge for this team But either way, it's not just about him and his play. It's more about the attitude. If we can get an entire locker room filled with this attitude, buying into the coaches, buying into the team, because this is a team statement. This isn't, I'm going to be the best wide receiver in the NFL next year, or I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be that. That's a team statement. We won't be at home next year. He cut out the we, but it's implied. I suppose it could be he or I. But still, you, you, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's saying he's going to buy tickets and go to the Super Bowl next year. He just was like, well, dude, why am I here sitting at home with these people? I should be at the game. Or maybe it's an even more random statement. He's talking about, you know, going to Vegas or something. Next year, 
I will not be at home. Going to my friend Jimmy's house. We already planned it out. It's going to be awesome. Making ribs, man. Oh, he makes some good ribs. Jimmy and his ribs and that grill. Mmm. No, but again, it's not it's not a talent issue with this team. Granted, we do need some talent. It's an attitude issue. We need more of this kind of attitude. People that genuinely just believe it. Aaron Rodgers needs to believe it. The wide receivers, the running backs, the offensive line, everybody needs to believe it. Don't buy into the decline. Because that's, that's, that's kind of where we're at, and that's the big fear. Some people just buy into it and go, eh, I guess this is it. This is the end. We used to be good. We're not so good anymore. Garbage. Two years ago, the Rams were 4-12. and 12. Last year, they jumped up to, be, to being a 11-win team, and this year they're in the Super Bowl. Two years ago, Jeff Fisher made them a 4-12 and 12 team. They had Jared Goff. They had Todd Gurley. New coach, new energy, new attitude. Just that alone. Yeah, they, they, they got some wide receivers, whatever. And yeah, by the way, they also had Aaron Donald. They had all the pieces, man. They didn't have the energy. This team back in 2016, the Rams, they bought into the old narrative. And it's easy to do. I mean, the Packers know what it's like to win. These guys never did. The players that are on the 2016 LA Rams team, unless they went and played somewhere else, they didn't know what winning was like. The Rams are not a winning franchise. They've been garbage for a very long time. They don't even know how to act like champions. Sean McVay comes in with a new staff and a new attitude, and suddenly this team knows exactly what it's like to become champions. How to play like it. You just gotta believe, man. And again, to talk about what I talked about yesterday with Antonio Brown, that's that's what's at stake. That's what's potentially at risk. This is very, very contingent on getting this coach to come in here and develop a message and have everybody buy in. Whether it's the fans, the media, the coaches, the the front office staff, the players, erase the last few years from your memory. Because in reality, it's been about four years of pretty bad football. I was looking at the Packers wide receivers, and we'll talk about this in a minute. The last time the Packers wide receivers were really any good, I mean, they were they were technically top 10 in 2016, but it was 2014. That was the last time we actually had some really good receivers, and it was Jordy and Cobb. That was a long time ago, man. I think as Packer fans, at least I can say for myself, I, I haven't really been able to admit that there's been this big of a problem. It's always just been like, oh, come on, we're so close. Why can't this happen? Why can't that happen? It, you always feel like you're just one away, and you don't realize that this is a big problem that's going to continue to get worse every year until we do a purge, until we recognize the problem, because we're just trying to drag so much dead weight. But the talent is through the roof. I mentioned um, three guys that the Rams had. Jared Goff, complete garbage compared to Aaron Rodgers. I mentioned Gurley. Gurley had four attempts in this past game. C.J. Anderson has taken over for him. And I mentioned Aaron Donald. We don't have an Aaron Donald yet, but we can certainly acquire one. On top of that, they've got a couple good wide receivers. Well, we've got one. We get a pass rusher, we get a wide receiver, and as far as the, the top weapons that they have that everybody's freaked out about, we're already on par with that, man. We're on par and then some. Aaron Jones is better than C.J. Anderson. Devontae Adams is better than Brandon Cooks. We go out and find ourselves a Robert Woods. Go get ourselves a, I don't necessarily want to say Aaron Donald, but a pass rusher. Combine a pretty good pass rusher on the edge with uh, Kenny Clark, and we've got ourselves Aaron Donald. There you go. Outside of that, though, again, it's not the talent, man. It's the attitude. It's the energy. It's the focus. Hand this exact team back to Jeff Fisher, and they're going to win maybe six games. Seven, maybe. Who? Maybe they'll get to eight and eight. I don't know. Nine and seven, possibly. Most of that is just going to be this team that kind of knows how to play, trying to overcome Jeff Fisher, but eventually he's going to drag them down. So yeah, they win nine, ten games next year. The year after that, they win six games. The year after that, they win four games. It's time to forget the past and move on. The, the 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018 seasons, that's all in the past. This is an entirely new era for the Green Bay Packers. How good are they going to be? How good can they be? This is very different. This isn't like, you know, making little tweaks to see if we can possibly improve from a 9-win team to a 10-win or a 10 to an 11 or an 11 to 12. Can we get in the playoffs? Can we get one step further in the playoffs? Whole new team, whole new vision, whole new scheme, different way of running, different way of passing, different outlook, different philosophies, different, uh, you know, levels of aggression and all the different tendencies we got all new assistant coaches. We're going to have a different-looking Aaron Rodgers and a different-looking wide receiver group and different you know routes that they're running and how open can they get. 
How do we utilize tight ends? All that stuff is changing. It's entirely different. And to circle back to my original point with Equinemius, you got to buy in. And he's already bought in. So it's a minor comment. It seemed like a nothing comment. My initial reaction was, who cares? Whatever. Everybody says that. But it's very important that they keep that going and we get more of that kind of attitude. More from guys like Jair. More from guys like Jamal. More from guys, I want to see Mike Daniels. I want to see all these guys. I want to see rah-rah guys get rah-rah. I want to see non-rah-rah guys get rah-rah. Let's see Nick Perry for once pop up and say something. Where's his statement? Where's him coming up? Where's his mea culpa coming up going, I was terrible, I'm sorry, this is the problem, it won't happen again. You'll see next year, I'll be right back at it. I mean, if I'm a coach or, or a GM trying to decide what to do with Nick Perry, and the guy just shows up, puts on pads, goes out and plays like garbage and leaves, I mean, do you know how much money he makes? He made, I think, like $40,000 per snap last year. Forty grand per snap. He makes a year's wage for some people in this country every time he takes a snap. And for him to just lumber out there and have an attitude, and, you know, whether he does or doesn't, there's no energy, there's no effort, he doesn't care. He doesn't have any comment, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't care about anything. And the outside linebackers in particular were that way, which is why I think the whole Winston Moss thing was especially toxic, because the entire outside linebacker group just seemed like, eh, not into it. Maybe that whole anti-media thing kind of rubbed off on him. I'm not really sure. But I, I need to hear something from somebody. You got to buy in or you got to get out. That's all I'm saying. But anyway, speaking of all that, um, some late breaking news. First of all, Mr. Justin Outen has officially been hired as our new tight ends coach. Now, I had mentioned that I was stunned that uh, Mr. Brian Angelicchio was supposedly getting retained by the Packers. It was an unofficial report, but it was a report nonetheless, and I just I didn't understand it. If there was any group on offense that was worse than tight ends, I, I struggled to know exactly what it was. I mean, again, we, we've never had any success with tight ends, but to have the quality of guys that we had come over here and play that poorly, I mean, we're talking multiple pro bowlers coming, well, I don't know if Kendricks was ever a pro bowler, but to have Jimmy Graham come over and have probably the worst year of his career. Mercedes Lewis come over here and have maybe the worst year of his career. And we're going to retain that coach? Why? So anyways, he is officially out. Uh, Justin Outen is the guy. He was the uh, offensive assistant for the uh, Atlanta Falcons. There's really nothing to go on here because he doesn't really have anything that you can analyze. He was a high school football coach and then became a Falcons coach. (laughs) He was an intern in 2016 and then uh, has been an offensive assistant for the last couple of years. So it's a, it's a relatively big jump, especially, again, when you consider he was a high school coach, and then he was a uh, intern in 2016, and he's just basically an assistant. But there is some overlap with him and LaFleur at, at, uh, in Atlanta. I don't know if that's a really big part of it. You know, there was some speculation. He must have been really impressed. Well, maybe. It, it maybe was just more or less them opening the door, giving him an opportunity to meet. But the one thing I like about it is we always want somebody that's proven. But guys that are really talented coaches have to start somewhere, right? Everybody you look at, LaFleur, everybody else, they always start off as assistants and interns and all this different stuff before somebody gives them their shot. You can't always be the retread guy. If you want to be on top, you got to be able to scout coaches. Now, maybe this guy's going to be terrible. But if you're always just taking everybody else's leftovers while all the actual coaches who know how to coach and find great coaches are out poaching the next great thing, they're getting the Sean McVays back when they're still really talented, but you just have him focused on like one position. You got him doing quarterbacks or wide receivers or tight ends or whatever it is you want him to do. I think that's kind of awesome. And who knows? Maybe the guy is really incredibly intelligent. He must have something going for him. I mean, he, he, we got rid of a guy that was supposedly going to stay so that we can bring this guy in. I'm sure there's other coaches all around the NFL that we could have brought in. This was our pick, a guy that was a high school football coach three years ago. So I'm excited. I, I, I think uh, Brian Angelicchio, I mean, I, I put him on the same tier with Ron Zook. I mean, everything that could have gone wrong just did, and it, it could not have been much worse. I don't know that we could have gotten much worse production from guys when you consider the caliber of Jimmy Graham and Mercedes Lewis. I don't know how it could have been any worse. So I don't know much about Justin, but I have to assume it's going to be an upgrade either way. He's going to be young. He's going to be hungry. It's a really, it's a really big jump. He's got his own position. You know, this is the next stepping stone. 
you know, after this, he's going to be looking to maybe move to wide receiver, offensive line, maybe jump back to college and get that offensive coordinator spot. Well, not back. He's never been to college, but whatever. Just kind of weave your way through, try to work your way up, get a head coaching job one of these days. No doubt that's on his radar. So he's going to come over here and try to prove something because everybody's going to be watching the Green Bay Packers tight ends to decide if he's going to be getting another shot somewhere else or not. And he's got, depending on who we keep, pretty good opportunities. If nothing else, you got Aaron Rodgers as your quarterback. He gives you a little bit of a boost. Beyond that, we are bringing back Luke Getze. Um, we're bringing him back this time instead of a wide receivers coach as a quarterback's coach. And I, I really think this has to do with his familiarity with Aaron Rodgers. There were some quotes floating around about what Luke Getze had said uh, last year or whatever about Aaron Rodgers, basically saying that those two are actually really good friends. I think it's a great thing that we have a quarterback coach. I mentioned before that I don't think it would be a good idea to not have a quarterback coach. I think it's important for somebody to be able to uh, kind of get him up to speed with the Lafleur offense. Um, I don't necessarily know that there's any real overlap between Luke Getze and his understanding of offense and what Lafleur is going to be looking to do. Uh, Luke Getze is primarily a college guy. Akron... West Virginia, Wesleyan, Pittsburgh, Indiana, Western Michigan, and then Packers, Packers. Then he goes back to Mississippi State as an offensive coordinator, wide receivers coach, and now he's back as a quarterback coach. So he's had some experience with quarterback coaching. He did that in Indiana. But I think the fact that he's got experience as an offensive coordinator, the fact that he has familiarity with the Green Bay Packers, and the fact that he has a good relationship with Aaron Rodgers makes this a very, very good fit. Now, how good was he as a wide receivers coach when he was here? I don't really know, but I also don't think that was a part of it. I think what I just said is why he's here. You know, again, as I mentioned, because I went back and looked at it, the Packers wide receivers have not been good for a very long time, and that includes the 2016 and 2017 season. Although in 2016, they were a top 10 receiver group, um, you know, kind of iffy. This is, this is definitely during the decline of the Packers wide receivers, and he was on that downward slide. Now, Devontae Adams did develop in that time period, but how much of that credit do you want to give to Luke Getze? Because if you give him that credit, then 2018 wide receivers coach deserves a massive amount of credit because he took a huge leap this year, even compared to last year. I think Devontae was going to grow no matter what. But anyways, again, it's not about that. I don't think any of this is about that as much as we all want it to be about that. It's all about stats and numbers and, and you know, well, they did these numbers over here, so they're they going to bring those numbers over here. That's not how that works. It's about fit, and as far as fit, it's just perfect. So Luke Getze coming back, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it because obviously Aaron Rodgers, he seems to be about relationships as much as he seems kind of like an aloof guy. You know, when he's when he's playing well, it's all about his relationships, right? It's, it's his relationship with Jordy Nelson. It was his relationship with Randall Cobb. It was his relationship with Geronimo. It's when he locks into a guy, that's his guy, and there's a relationship there talked about his previous quarterback coach, not Signetti, but before that, the great relationship he had and how angry he was when when they get, when the Packers got rid of him. You know, even in the press conferences, he talks about his relationships. I know it's some strained thing with his family. I don't really know the details of that, but there's people that he cares about and they're close to that are friends, that he treats like family. If, if I'm not mistaken, he takes that kind of stuff very seriously and he wants relationships. He needs that. He intertwines that in football a lot. I think some guys don't do that. You look at, for example, the Antonio Browns. I hate to keep bringing it up, but I don't think he cares about relationships. Antonio Brown is about Antonio Brown and Antonio Brown's money. And that's what he cares about. And if you can give me what I want, I'll play for you. I want money, and I want a Super Bowl ring, and success, and yards, and I want basically whatever I want is what I want. I think Aaron Rodgers is willing to be selfless, but he needs support, he needs community, he needs all that stuff, and I don't think the Packers had that. I think everybody does to some degree, I just think it's more so with Aaron Rodgers. Packers didn't have that. It, it felt cold and it felt aloof, right? Again, no celebrating on the sideline, aside from, you know, Rodgers and Devontae kind of doing the little head bump hug thing, and then they walk to the sideline, but, you know, nothing from the coaches, just, there was no, I mean, even the way the communication system was set up, you had... Your, what was it, the third string coach communicating with Mike McCarthy. And then you had uh, Deshaun Kaiser was talking to Aaron Rodgers. And then that's how the coaches, the, that's how McCarthy and Rodgers kind of communicated was between two different quarterbacks. 
And I don't know where Signetti was in all this. I, ne- I don't even know what he looks like. I never saw him. I never saw him talk to Aaron Rodgers. I never saw It was just very cold and aloof, and nobody really... It's like everybody was just kind of forced to be in their own bubble. There was just there was no team there. It was a group of individuals who got called onto the field who listened to a play, and it's like, okay, i got to go on the field now. Okay, i got to stand here now. Okay, i got to run this route now. Is the ball coming? Nope. Okay. Guess we go back to the sideline now. We got to get that back, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited about this Luke Getze hire because Aaron Rodgers is maybe the most important piece, and getting him somebody, assuming that's correct, I don't know. This is from Luke Getze. For all I know, he hated Luke. Aaron Rodgers hated Luke Getze. Getze just wanted to fire off about how they're great friends. I don't know. I'd be willing to bet Aaron Rodgers got a phone call about this and approved because if they didn't do that, that would be ridiculous. Which, by the way, they should have done that with Signetti as well, but I'm sure they didn't. But if, if if the biggest selling point is Luke Getze and Aaron Rodgers are best friends and you don't even ask Aaron Rodgers about it, I'm concerned about the uh, the quality of our coaching staff. But anyways, it looks like things are really starting to take shape. Um, we've got a lot of a lot of youth in our coaching staff, which is fine. Um, you know, again, you, you, you've got plenty of retreads, and I'm sure there's a lot of really good quality coaches that are, you know, a little, little long in the tooth. But, um, you know... He, I, I really think Lafleur is looking for young, not not young for the sake of young, but you know, youthful and hungry people that are aspiring, people that that don't want to stay in Green Bay. As weird as that might sound, you're not looking for an older guy that wants to retire somewhere, for somebody looking for their last contract. Right, that was my concern with Bruce Arians, despite the massive amount of success they had in Arizona. It feels like a retirement play. Like this is where I'm going to go. And I'm going to live out there, and I'm going to make, you know, this will be my last contract, and we're going to play it out. Not to say he won't work hard and, and all that stuff, but, I mean, this is about getting comfortable now. Lafleur is looking for guys that are getting a break in Green Bay, like our new tight ends coach. He's getting a massive promotion. He is beyond, I mean, you know, Lafleur kind of got ripped because of how, like, starstruck he was to be in Lambeau and he just couldn't believe it and I think he's looking for people that are that same way they can't believe the opportunity they're being given they're so excited to be here they can't wait like I mean Lafleur's getting to the building at like three o'clock in the morning and everybody's already there and they're already grinding and they're all just freaking out and then you walk in like what's up man like dude you ready to go it's like yeah let's go I'm making that up but that that's sort of the energy like everybody wants to be here you can't not be here you just like you gotta go home and sleep and like hug the kids, but whatever. We we got a we, we we got a Super Bowl to win. You don't want a guy that's 65 years old who really has a hard time. You know he needs his sleep and the physical aspect does take a physical toll. And they show up and they're grumbling like, oh, here we go again, another team, another year. That's exactly the attitude we can't have. You know the attitude you have every Monday when you go into work. <laughs> The attitude a lot of us are going to have on Tuesday because we had yesterday off. For those of us that had yesterday off, going to go in, walk in, and be like, oh, it's this place again. I can't believe I'm here again. Why am I here again? What is happening? That's what you don't want. You want to find people that you believe this is their dream job. Not forever necessarily, but yes, I would kill for what you're offering me right now. I'd be willing to bet Luke Getze could not jump fast enough at the opportunity to go back to Green Bay to be the the to be Aaron Rodgers coach knowing full well what that if I put in my time and help improve Aaron Rodgers who's who's already underperforming it, it, you know if you just probably don't show up and he doesn't have a quarterback coach and the team is just a little bit better he's already going to improve but now I get the credit for that and all I got to do is like treat him like a decent human being and kind of get in his ear and, and be like, hey, what about this? And, and you know, I just want to help you kind of, you know, Lafleur was talking about maybe doing a couple tweaks. You want to go over that and whatever, whatever. And then, hey, how about after this, you know, you and I go get a burger or whatever, tofu sandwich. I, I don't know what, what he eats. He doesn't eat cheese or whatever. Very worried about his diet. Is a, to- <laughs> is a tofu sandwich a thing? I don't even know. Might as well be. At least you can cut it with some bread, man. I got to put something on that stuff. That is the worst. But I'm excited. I I, I feel it. And again, getting back to the the whole equanimous thing. It's it's a new staff. It's a new day, right? Just purge all that bad stuff. And that's that's part of the benefit of getting rid of all the other coaches, because those other coaches, what are they doing when they show up on Monday? Hey, what's going on, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta get my coffee. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I'll be right there. Right, and he's got his old routine from the old coaches, which is what? Kind of show up, 
read the paper, you know. I don't know. Please understand, I'm not saying this is a prediction. I'm just saying that this is sort of the general attitude. It's going through the motions. Same day, same city, same team. Tired of living in this podunk little town. I want to get out of here. Send me off to New York or something. Let me go to Florida. Let me play for Arians. I want to go on the beach. Same grumpy quarterback. Same garbage team. Blah, 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 blah. Nobody listens. It's like, you know what? Everybody out. Everybody out. So that when we start over, it's a fresh, it's just a complete breath of fresh air. So when the players come back, they don't even recognize the place. You got a whole new batch of coaches who are all, you know, happy, excited, motivated. I mean, think about what was happening when the Packers were doing well. It was like we were losing staff every single year. Why? Because we'd, we'd go out and find really young, talented guys. They'd work their way through Green Bay, and then they'd get hired somewhere else as offensive coordinators or quarterback coaches or offensive coordinators or head coaches. And again, you, you kind of get to that point where you burn off all the good stuff, and you're left with just kind of like this, this cosmic sludge. All the good players get jobs elsewhere, and it, all that's left are the guys that Mark McCarthy doesn't want to fire and nobody else wants to hire. Got to clean it, man. Deep clean it. Power wash it. Scrub it. We're starting over, and I'm excited. I'm excited Angelique is gone. And even though he's a younger, newer guy to the staff, I don't care. Everybody out. So anyways, I'm excited. I mean, it, it, it could go, obviously, one of two ways. It could be a lot of inexperience that starts to show itself next year. Or it could just be that, you know, this is the spark that this team needed. Because, again, not so much a talent issue. It's an energy issue. It's a a focus issue, a drive issue, a grind issue, a staleness issue, right? Get new, get young, get fired up, go win some football games. And we'll see what happens. But anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Tuesday. It's the worst day of the week. Enjoy your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.